For your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose. And welcome to episode number 361 of This Old Marketing for Friday, February 3rd, 2023. And with me, as always, is my pal, my colleague, and a guy who's retired just one less time than Tom Brady, Mr. Joe Polizzi. <laughs> that's good. That makes me. That was laugh. my favorite. That, that's the, yeah. That's that's that one. That one made me giggle when I uh, when I wrote it. Down. I saw the. I mean, the whole three hundred and seventy-five million dollar ten-year deal for Brady is pretty amazing to think that this is more money than he's going to be making that he was making as a quarterback. That's right. Yeah, it's just this. This whole quarterbacking thing was literally just a warm-up act for his. 10 year decade long broadcasting Did you see, do you see the memes <laughs> going around about like Greg Olson crying and things like <laughs> no I have so not for people that this that. is maybe a little bit too insider but Greg Olson yeah. who used to be a tight end I think for the Carolina Panthers really good tight end that is he correct. started yeah, doing broadcasting good, yeah. he's not bad it's not horrible for for Fox and so Brady getting this Fox uh, announcing deal, apparently that's the spot that Brady's going to take or something. And poor Greg Olson. Oh, is it? Oh, well, there's oh people, he's taking, he's taking there's that There's people spot. talking yeah. about that. I mean, obviously, you put in, <clears throat> you're put you putting in $38 million a year over 10 years. You're going to give Brady whatever spot he wants or whatever is going to sure. <laughs> make yeah, him he's the gonna most money. He's going to become the – right. So that's right. Just, just kind of funny. Well, Fox doesn't have um, Joe Buck and, and Troy Aikman, um, so they're – Yeah, where'd they go? They went to, to – uh, Monday Night Football. That's right. Yeah. So that's, that's and that's ESPN. Now, correct. So that's, that's, that's correct. A, ABC yeah. Disney Disney Network. Yeah. That that's whole, right. That and so uh, yeah, it, we'll see what happens. I mean, because you know the you know the meme that should be going around is um, last season Jason Witten, who was of course a tight end for the Dallas right. Cowboys and a, a really good one, Hall of Famer, first round ballot, all that stuff. Um, he he got a broadcasting deal, and I think he lasted four games this season. Oh, I didn't know this before they before they canned him. Yeah, they. I mean, he was not good. He was not good at his job, and so yeah, he does. He no longer is broadcasting, and then he came back. Right then, he came back to the uh, to not to play uh, for the Raiders, I believe, um, and that was last year. And then and then. Yeah, retired again and is <laughs> off doing other things. Well, that job is very difficult, <clears throat> and it's a very, it, it's a lot different than catching passes. Uh, actually, going into the broadcasting oh, booth. Yeah, and did, did you see there was a great um, there was a great uh, uh, little mini documentary on uh, Gene Serator, who is one of the most famous refs. Um, yeah, because he and he in, does the uh, analysis for the uh, the Romo Jim Nance crew, correct for yeah. CBS. Yeah, and he's and he um, <clears throat> they did a whole mini document on his sort of how he came up through the ranks, and he's actually said that that he's you know he's he's refed football games and uh, basketball games for his entire life, and he said that being the rules and analyst for the broadcasting because he's not only doing the game he's at he's also going and doing special guest appearances on other games oh during the day that's right when they bring him in on a on a sunday that's right we're gonna cut to gene gene what do you think well that was a bonehead call that was just terrible right right Uh, well speaking of that i know okay people are already don't tune out we're actually going to get to marketing stuff in a second but we have to talk football because we now have a super bowl we do have a Super between Bowl. Philadelphia. Are we allowed to say Super Bowl? I think that's a what? thing, right? We're not allowed to say it. It's, do we have to pay something if we do? Is that? I don't know. It there's did. a game <laughs> without the explicit. There's a game on NFL February 12th that, that people are going to watch. There, that is that mostly is for the. And they will be watching the ads. For the ads. But that's what do right. you feel? I guess my quick take on <laughs> first of all the, the okay. I, I'm going to rant a little bit on San Francisco, and I know that they were to their fourth string quarterback during the year, but you got to be kidding me that there's not somebody else on that team that can throw a ball. 
Like they in like don't they have like the kicker or the punter or somebody that knows how to throw a pass? Because by the middle of the third quarter, they didn't have anybody that could throw a forward pass. So they just said, "But we're done. It's all over." Yeah, they just because their over. third yeah, their third was... string quarterback Purdy <clears throat> is it Purdy? Purdy. Yeah, so he injured, he blew out his elbow or whatever in the first first, first quarter, season or first first uh first, and yeah, that first was quarter, basically yeah. the end of the game because then they br- brought in I don't know who well he's their third I mean right by the way he's he their is third their string. third string quarterback yeah. yeah and then they brought in the fourth string guy and he got hurt in the third quarter and so that was that was kind of it Christian apparently they're really mad at the NFL. Um, and and there are a lot of teams that are actually expressing real problems here because you you can't designate apparently uh, there's there's some rule with the NFLPA or with the NFL that says it's it you you're you're not allowed to designate a fifth quarterback or something um, because they have Christian McCafferty who is their which is what they should have done yeah they just he's just they take the just, ball and flipped it around. And yeah, run and, with it. and run with it, and then maybe throw yeah. it if he if he if he can, right? So so that would have been the I, that would have been the play, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So and then the and then the whole thing. I mean, congratulations to both teams. Congratulations to Kansas City. I think that you've got maybe two of the be- two the two best teams. Maybe we're going to see play each other. But the I can't stand it when the refs become so part of the game that it actually alters what happens during the game. I just cannot stand it. The fact that that yeah. one play that yeah, nobody that knew Bengals, it was yeah. done except for one ref, and then he had to go to the other refs and said, "Oh, by the way, I was blowing my whistle over there in the corner, but nobody could hear me." Could, yeah. Um, so what? And they got to do they gotta and they got to do over because of it. Yeah. And the whole, I mean, yeah. nobody knew except for the one guy, and he, he was sort of trotting on the field, trying, but he he was like he didn't want to be seen. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, I'll yeah. tell him afterward. I'll let him play this out. Yeah. And then I'll tell him that it doesn't count yeah. afterward. I just was, oh, jeez, whatever. Yeah. So, what else is going on? Football. Besides, all well, that? we have the. So, I mean, the, there are there are the the Super Bowl ads. Um, do you have a any? Have you seen any of them? Have you seen the previews of any I've seen, of them? Uh, yeah, I've, I, I mean, mean you is, obviously sent me a link that that I am more than happy to put in the show notes about the the yeah. Super Bowl extravaganza. Uh, you know, here's one, here's my take on it this year. Uh, it seems like they're doing a better job teasing the ads because it's not just like I guess with the Gronk one and maybe with the the Jack Harlow Doritos ad. They they have a teaser ad, and then they're going to have. I mean, I know that's been done sure. before; it's nothing new, but it seems to be more companies are doing that. Would you agree with the the whole teasing yes. angle? Well, I, and this is my take. I'm, I'm I'm writing a little bit about this for my weekly post. But <clears throat> the other thing that I've noticed, and this kind of started in the last couple of years, which is it used to be that Super Bowl ads were 30 seconds, one and done, right? And maybe they replayed that ad or maybe they had a couple of different versions of it. They would run for a flight across the next month or even quarter, but it was rare that it was any more than that, right? It was meant to sort of gather attention, get be newsworthy, and be kind of a big production tentpole piece that would, you know, carry over into the mainstream news and it would get earned media coverage yeah. and all of that. Um, and what I'm noticing now, and this is really relevant to the show, is that I started looking at some of these things, and it'll be hard to know because because there's so many teaser ads, you don't really understand what they're doing. But I've been reading behind the scenes of some of these campaigns, and much more of them now are introductions, literally just introductions to integrated content campaigns uh, than they are one and dones, right? So there's much more around the idea. Like there's the one gaming company that's basically going to, use their Super Bowl time to introduce the fact that they're going to be rolling out 40 NFTs to promote over time to promote this launch of this new game, which is going to happen later this year. Another one, I think it's H&R Block, is basically using any Super Bowl time they have to basically promote the fact that they're going to have these events, these physical events that are going to be all about how to... uh, not, well, do your taxes and have, you know, basically take advantage of 
they're calling it the tailgate, I think, and they're going to set up these like tailgating events uh, across the country where you can actually get your taxes done and Got it. all that kind of stuff. So it's so it seems like there's a lot more of this uh, using the Super Bowl ad to introduce a content campaign more than anything else, more than more than it is this sort of one and done. Now, of course, there's still the big. Uh, you know, Clydesdale sure. horses and beautiful songs and touch your hearts and all that. But, you know, I, I just found it interesting that there's a lot more integration in terms of the Super Bowl campaigns than than there used to be. Seven million dollars. I just looked it up. Seven million mm-hmm. to get your hands mm-hmm. on a Super Bowl spot, uh, which I guess is well, I don't know. I mean, you don't have no you don't have the crypto companies this year that are spending Gobs right. and gobs of money. So I actually think they went from what was there six or seven last year to zero this year. I don't think there's one crypto focused company that took that. Uh, the, well, there's the one. There's there's this gaming company, but yeah, but that's yes, not. Other yeah, than that, that's a, a little bit. That's not a cryptocurrency exchange. A little, yeah, a little bit like different. That. That's so things are. I mean, how quickly it's amazing. How quickly one year. things change yeah. in in one year. But I still think. I mean, these are in most cases billion dollar companies that are spending for this lightning rod thirty seconds. Oh, of course, spot. and yeah. I get it. Yeah, I yeah, get the yeah. whole thing. I mean, you, yeah. you just mentioned a lot of those things, but I always like doing my. You know, when when I started writing my, here's what you can buy for a, yep. you know, an ad in the Super Bowl seven. I'm like, you could buy, you know, three hundred custom magazines delivered for the next, you know. It issues to yeah. fifty thousand of your best customers for the next twenty years, and you could buy you know all the stuff that you could get for seven million. And seven million is just the placement; it doesn't even count. Yeah, I mean, how much are they play- yeah. paying? Like, how much is Experian paying John Cena? Which I oh, hate I those mean, it's commercials. Millions, it's millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean that's too. the thing; they're they're paying seven. But what you have to remember is they're paying seven million to actually get the airtime. But they're paying multi millions of dollars to get the thing yep. produced too. I mean, a Super Bowl campaign is ten million easy, right? For any of these companies, well, that is it, you know, like tra- is it like is it like a trade show? It. Because I mean, historically, in in a, like when you are exhibiting at a trade show, I mean, I used to be part of like National Manufacturing Week, and you had Granger there, and they would spend a million dollars just to have their booth space, and then they used to spend a couple million dollars extra to activate that. It was usually all right. you put. You generally the rule was you spend twice the amount on activation that you would on the space. Yeah. Do you think that's, that's about right. the same? With do they spend so Experian spending seven no, million dollars try, on the what, ad? Do they spend fourteen million on everything else? No, they try not to. They it's the the general rule of thumb is that what they call working media. So working media would be the ads, the basically the media space, right? Um, and, and so the working media, you want to be, it's the other way around, right? You want it to be twice, about twice. It's, it, there's, you know, different, different brands have different calculations on this, but you want to have about twice. So in other words, if you're, if you're spending 7 million to, uh, put an ad on the Super yeah. Bowl, generally speaking, you'd want to be thinking about a $3 million production budget and, you know, getting it. Getting it, got uh, it. Getting so it's it ha- in yeah, half the cost. Okay, the can. I yeah. got you. That makes yeah, that makes sense. So you're, I mean, yeah. So you know, we we could talk about these ads forever, but you you love the Super Bowl for the ads, I think, more than anything else. I mean, you sit and watch them, and you, and, I do, and you analyze yeah. and them. I dissect them, and yeah, I, I dissect do. You have a do you sure. do you yeah, feel I mean, like there's going to be a winner? Are you already putting bets down? Have you do you have your FanDuel account or DraftKings account that you're betting on? This <laughs> stuff? No. I do not. This- I don't even. I mean, I would not surprise me to know that that's true, um, but I do not. No, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, Budweiser is going to do. They've got some special thing planned with the Clydesdales. With yeah, with the Clydesdales and the puppies, and and they're doing something. They've got a little teaser ad going that they're that they're going to do something. But by the way, this is the first time that they've given up. Um, uh, that InBev has given up exclusivity. So it's the first time you're going to see other beers too. Oh yeah. I saw the companies. There's the Coors Light Miller Light competition. That's right. One, which is again, Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know if that's DraftKings or FanDuel, but I think FanDuel is Gronk. It's just crazy. I I was just, I was just at a meeting. I'm in, I live in Cleveland for those people that don't know. And if, if you 
been listening for a while and you don't know, there's probably issues there. But I'm driving down 480, and there's two <laughs> types of billboards now. Only two you can get. You're either going to see lawyers or you're going to see right. DraftKings, FanDuel, or what are the other 17 <laughs> right. there you gambling go. apps because yeah. because uh, sports gambling has just been legalized in Ohio. It is yep. everywhere. And, I, and I'm predicting the downfall of society. I'm going to say it. Yeah. I'm, and it's going to happen really yeah. quickly because of this, in my opinion. Biff's gambling palace is coming to an, an Ohio city near you. For I can sure. see it. And the worst part is I was yeah. talking with my youngest, who's 19, and we've been talking about it a lot. And, he, and a lot of his friends are have these accounts, and they're using whatever money that, <laughs> that they don't have in crypto anymore and spending it on parlays and all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God. I just I mourn for society uh, because <laughs> it, it, I do society. because a lot yeah. of I mean I I, <laughs> I obsess about a little bit of this uh, online gambling that's that's going on where you see it yeah. happen in the games. So as your your kids get into these games that they're twelve, thirteen, fourteen, they're le- they're basically gambling all these different things that you can get uh, well from what you wear to to the weapons and all those stuff and. So you start off with that gambling mentality. So they've got it while their brain hasn't even formed yet. And then they're going to get access to <laughs> DraftKings and FanDuel and everything else. And I'm like, this is not going to end well. And I know this is not, you know, I'm, I'm sort of derailing the whole episode for you. And I'm sorry about that. But this has That's to be right. said. It's it's no, no, it's it's there you go. There you go. It feeds it. It feeds into nothing. It feeds into all of it. Yeah, it, it feeds, feeds into, into nothing into else into on this show, yeah. except yeah. for the fact that if you have kids, just be careful. And I'm not, I'm not getting an account. I flat out won't because I get addicted to stuff like that. I like going into casinos, but I have to go there. I have to drive my car or get on a plane, go to a casino, spend actual money that's coming out of my wallet and put it into a machine or on the table. And that's a very, very different thing. Then I'm going to transfer this over this money that I'm this digital money over to this thing and look at how easy it is and oh they're going to give me two hundred or two thousand or five thousand dollars for just for trying <laughs> yeah that that yeah. won't end up really <clears throat> no that's no, not going to no. end up well so uh, do you uh, so we'll end with this are you do you do any of that do you get into the drive I don't no I'm no. very glad I'm very thankful no I'm very thankful. Um, the most I ever do is I do fantasy football, which is a paid where yeah. I can, and I actually won this hey, year. I actually won my fantasy football. Thank you very, very much. Nice. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I won this year, but you know, which was I don't know, seven hundred dollars or something. Um, but uh, but that's the only thing I ever do. I did. I I have not gotten into, and it's not I, you can't do it here in California online. To, it's all Yet. illegal. So. Yet. Yet. Yeah, we'll see. But it failed. It failed in the election yeah, this year. It'll, so it'll be, we'll yeah. See if Ga- it Ga- all, comes back. all gambling and weed will be legalized in the entirety of the United States in the next five years, I would say. Indeed. So, because Indeed. Th- those are the important things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, let's get to our show before we. Lose I thought we were into this the show. Yeah, well, we were, we were kind talking of about Super Bowl yeah, we had, ads. We, we did our we did our yeah. first story. We did our first okay. top of the story, which was our Super Bowl. Um, and by the reason we're the reason we're talking about the the Super Bowl this week is because next week we have a special episode, which we'll tell you all about later. Um, but we do have a special episode next week. Um, but this week uh, we do have some news to talk about quite a bit. We've got the Chat GPT. Um, it's not going away. It is just remains as hot and buzzworthy as ever. Two uh, quick articles we'll talk about there is one is BuzzFeed and then basically the watching their stock price rocket after they talk about their integration. And then, of course, Microsoft had the big announcement about what they're going to do with Bing uh, and, uh, and ChatGPT in the coming weeks. Then we'll talk a little bit about earnings season here with uh, both Spotify and Facebook having really strong earnings uh, announcements. But um, we'll talk about Spotify's past with what they've been doing and talking about podcasting and whether or not uh, they this is sort of peak podcast or whether or not we're actually looking at uh, the sort of growth of exclusive shows. Uh, we'll talk about Facebook as, as well and what they've been doing and sort of how they're simultaneously blowing things up with the metaverse, but also 
again becoming a, a, a cash uh, a cash cow. And then if we've got time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, LinkedIn and their newsletter success and all of the things that they've been doing with LinkedIn uh, newsletters and uh, how many they actually have now and what's going on with the future of LinkedIn newsletters. Then we'll get to rants and raves and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, well, Joe, we'll talk about Mr. Beast. Um, and as usual, Mr. Beast is doing something that Joe likes, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess that it's a rave. Uh, and then I am going to basically talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Academy Awards and streaming oh. services and how maybe the streaming services have lost their way a little no. bit. So, uh, no, we'll, say, we'll say it ain't so. That. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, fascinating, okay. given our pe- previous discussions on that topic. Um, okay, so let's jump right into it, um, which is uh, our first story, which is around, sort of centered on a couple of stories around uh, chat GPT and artificial intelligence. Uh, this first article that we'll uh, link to in the show notes comes courtesy of the dataeconomy.com. Interesting website, by the way. It was the first time I got to see this one. Uh, and the story that opens up basically says, BuzzFeed chat GPT integration, the stock surges after an open AI deal. BuzzFeed chat GPT integration news skyrocketed. The BuzzFeed stock price uh, is just the latest example of a company that has benefited from being linked to chat GPT. BuzzFeed, an online media organization, announced that it has plans to leverage AI provided by OpenAI, the developers of ChatGPT, in its content generation efforts. Uh, This month has seen some of the largest trading volumes ever for companies providing AI-related services, and this looks to remain unchanged in the future. Uh, BuzzFeed intends to use OpenAI's text synthesis technology, which is modeled after the popular tool ChatGPT, to generate unique quizzes and possibly other material in the near future. The news caused a 200% increase in BuzzFeed stock price. Uh, in a blog post published on Friday, BuzzFeed confirmed the decision uh, and has also linked a partnership with Meta, whose own BuzzFeed stocks will find this to be a very pleasant experience, says the article. So what say you? Oh, well, let me go on to the, and get the sure, other one really sure. quickly here just while we're here, um, which is uh, with regard to Microsoft. And their latest uh, integration with ChatGPT, it seems like the world is integrating with ChatGPT right now, Uh, this coming courtesy of TechCrunch, the article opening up by saying Microsoft is working to incorporate a faster version of OpenAI's ChatGPT, known as GPT-4, into Bing in the coming weeks in a move that would make the search engine more competitive with Google, according to a new report from Semaphore. Uh, The integration would see Bing using GPT-4 to answer search queries. People familiar with the matter told Semaphore that the main difference between ChatGPT and ChatGPT4 is speed. Uh, although ChatGPT sometimes takes up to a few minutes to form a response, GPT-4 is said to be a lot quicker in responding to queries. The latest software's response are also said to be more detailed and more human-like. I'm not sure how that's possible. Um, anyway, the article goes on to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, you know, the, the integration and how it might start an integration, things like DALI um, and the image creation mm-hmm. and, and all that sort of thing. So what say you to all this is ChatGPT obviously is the is the bell of the ball right oh it's now. amazing it's the it's you know we were talking before the show are are so happy for our, our friend paul reitzer at marketing mm-hmm. ai institute who who is seeing amazing growth right now because everybody's trying to figure out ai and marketing and content and what do we need to do um so a couple takes on this first of all with with microsoft people are asking the question what is bing you know, like they didn't know that Microsoft had a search engine. They do. It's <laughs> right. called Bing, and they've had it for quite some time now. Um, there, I think there's. We talked about it on the last episode. Brilliant move by Microsoft to invest in open AI at the from the beginning. Oh, whatever they yeah. did with the billion dollars, uh, which is nothing for them, couch cushion money at the time, and now they're they're going to take a. I think be able to take a lead in a competitive product that nobody saw coming with Google. And I really think there is an opportunity. Right. Google's got to be sweating, as we discussed last time. But the fact that if they can integrate this, and from what I hear, and I, you know, in talking with Paul and some other really smart people, much smarter than I am, I've heard that if you, if you think the chat GPT is something, just wait. Like, it's nothing compared to what GPT-4 is going to be and bring in. So Bing's going to integrate this thing in. I think the the biggest opportunity here is if they get anything close to reasonable from being able to answer some questions that you ask, voice searches the 
or voice results is the opportunity because I'll give you an example. If I, if I ask Siri a question and I say, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? Or what's going on? What's playing at the movie theater close to me? Um, for most of the time I'll get a result. It's like, it shows me on the browser or it's things that basically give me a Google result. I don't want that. I want somebody to pipe back a vo vocal response to me in something that sounds like a human being. This is what Microsoft's going to be able to do. And I think it's going to be game changing for them. Who knows, right? I mean, Microsoft's done a lot of duds in their day as well, but they've had more winners and losers. And that's why they're the second most valuable company in the world, I think. Second or third, if you will. Um, so there's that. And then the BuzzFeed thing, I think, is so funny because I think the stock price went up. It was like a buck. And it went all the way up to almost four dollars, and I think it sits around two thirty or two. So still, a, an incredible bump up from this news. And I don't know if investors think that they're just going to get rid of all the human editors and content creators, but what it's doing with content creators in businesses or just individual content creators is it's making us look, forcing us to look at the process. Where do we yeah. have human beings in the process right now where we could replace that with a robot on our shoulder, do things quicker and better for some of these tasks that humans shouldn't be doing anymore? And then can we reallocate time that human beings can be creative and amazing storytellers and more strategic? And I think the answer to all that is yes. We don't know exactly how this is going to look, but now it just seems even though you and I, we, how many episodes have we talked about AI and AI content? It's been years and years we've been talking about this, but this is the first time that you have almost in one fell swoop, everybody in content marketing is, oh, we got to look at this now. We got to take this thing seriously. And I think that's what's happening. Agreed. I think, you know, the my take on this is that it, it, it's, this is the next logical step. <clears throat> and the interesting thing to me is, you know, the, the other thing that ChatGPT is making headlines this week around is how many uh, tests it's passed, right? You know, whether it's, uh, you know, passing an MBA uh, or getting a degree or, you know, acting as a lawyer. Yep. You know, there's, there's all these kinds of things that are now going around in these sort of semi-sexy headlines that are talking about how ChatGPT is is you know, can graduate college now, basically taking a test and write these things. And the BuzzFeed article is what I've, what I've been saying to, to, to clients certainly and to, and to anyone who will listen is that if chat GPT is going to replace any of these things, it says more about the thing that they're replacing than it says about chat yes. GPT. And so in other words, if it's passing your MBA exam, that says way more about your MBA exam than it does about ChatGPT. Uh, if it's passing any test, like you know, the, the, on a education or that sort of thing, your test is old, not not ChatGPT is new. And this with BuzzFeed, this to me says way more about BuzzFeed's standard. Con if it starts to replace and do these, you know, let's be honest, these quizzes. Yes, it, there's <laughs> the articles that, but I mean, BuzzFeed not known for their differentiating journalism. Let's just put it that way. So the fact that ChatGPT could come in and write some of these articles, great, fine, wonderful. You could construct that content all day long and talk about the top, you know, the listicle of this and the listicle of that and give me 10 things for this. ChatGPT is great at that. It's great at that, but it's not that's not that's not a long game. You I you I just don't believe you can play the long game with that because that may give you, a, and I think, by the way, chat, the BuzzFeed right now is a is a meme stock more than anything else. So, I think it's going to be it's going to rock it up and down and and all of this. And I don't think, by the way, that BuzzFeed is going to get a tremendous amount of efficiency here. Uh, and I don't think they're going to get a long a, a set of long term value without also investing in the human side of this. Right? I I totally get where AI and ChatGPT can be assistive in constructing content. Uh, one of our good friends, Mitch Joel, d demonstrated this where he was saying, you know, he had ChatGPT uh, assemble 10 promotional tweets around uh, a webinar that he was going to be on. And it did great. 
because you actually put the URL in and and basically it went out and it scanned the URL so it pulled the guest name and and it and it did an amazing job of assembling 10 tweets. That's the kind of content that it's immediate that in the short term this is immediately going to uh, to take over. And so that does not remove the human from actually creating the differentiating webinar or it doesn't, you know, the differentiating white paper or the <laughs> differentiating blog post or the differentiating novel or movie or whatever it is. It is that's where that is. Now, having said that, that's the perfect use case for Microsoft, right? Because what you're trying to do with Bing is have somebody assemble the best recommendation on content that already exists. You're trying to have a logical, wonderful assembly of answers for a particular question that can be much more human-like than just a, a wall of links. So it's the so from from a Microsoft. So it, it these these two pieces are perfect bookends for me on where. AI and generative content is perfectly fit for the human experience and where it actually will fall way short of the human experience. Sure. And so I th it just these these couldn't be more representative of where I think AI is going and where it is. It's today. interesting that I've had a couple online conversations with people because I've been writing about it on LinkedIn. That's that'll yeah. say um I'm never going to trust a computer, you know, it's lazy if you if you trust computer content or robot content over whatever. And I'm like, first of all, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we're, we're not, it's not about the content right now, to your point. I look at it as a total process change. So we are changing. We, if you look at all the things that you have to do to create amazing content, there, there's 70% of that process that could be replaced pretty efficiently and maybe even better. Through a tool, through multiple tools. Great. Look at those. So I think that's the case right now where you're seeing it's yeah. not. So I say, don't look at it as a replacement in content. You still need strategy. It's almost like if you look at back in the day when Kasparov did his whole test against Big Blue and chess, is that what they found is that is once you, the, the, the robot is better at the execution of a strategy, but not at developing the strategy humans are still better at developing the strategy but then they can do all that's the scenarios right. after that it's the same type of thing as a human you still come up that's with a right. strategy but if from an execution standpoint a lot of this can be done by a robot maybe to what we've been talking about forever on this maybe it's really important right now to build a trusted brand and to be trusted because yeah. of the stories that you're yeah. telling because you can well, differentiate that's through that. That's the differentiation. Yeah. That's the differentiation, right? I mean, the 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 inherent nature of ChatGPT and AI is that it represents the highest point of the bell curve. So it is by definition going to give you the most average answer. <laughs> and so it, it and which is great if you're trying for the average answer. In other words, I want the easiest, clearest uh, and most well-assembled answer based on a corpus of content. In other words, I can look at this this pool of content and say, "Tell me what that what the representative answer of that is." That's why it gets so many answers wrong now, is because the internet is wrong about things. And it's there's data great sets articles are, yeah, out not there about all of its healthcare. data sets are right. That's the when when Correct. it gets the, it will it, fix that, I believe, long term. It's as smart. It's as smart as the internet yeah. is, right? And so, which is why I have always been uh, making the case for AI will really get interesting when it starts using verticalized data sets, right? Curated, better curated data sets. And that will be a vertical set of answers, right? When it starts using a verticalized set of, when it represents the best answer in a particular data set, now we can start trusting it because it, that vertical, verticalization is what you're looking for, right? You're always looking for the robots to go in and tell you what the, basically, what, what does the data say, right? What, do, what, what does all of this data mean? And that's the part where it's helpful. But what's helpful for humans in this particular case is to actually go against that. Um, you know, somebody on on my social feed said, I don't, I'm, I'm worried that at some point it learns everything I've written and it becomes a better version of me, right? It writes stuff in a better version of me. And I said, the, the, the challenge with that is that it can never be you because you can make the decision tomorrow to go completely against to everything you've different. ever written That's right. and do something different. 
and that the AI will not be able to do that, and but you will be able to do that. So it can never be more you than you. That's the that's the uh, anyway. Yeah, well, you yeah you can make there, the decision yeah. to to zig instead of zag to be different to exactly if you, if you exactly. wish. To. But I guess I would say when people are saying uh, I'm never going to read this type of content or engage in it, I, I think I'm calling BS on that because I believe in the next few years you already yeah, are. We already are. You already we already are. are is one thing. I told somebody the other day. I said I've been in I'm doing fantasy sports with Yahoo forever, and that's that's been. They're they're feeding me AI content, <laughs> computer created content for the last five years. So this is not new. I get my it's, update. How did you do? That's all computer generated content. Well, it's it it's here's the thing. It it's it's you know there's that <laughs> going back to the movie Fletch. It's it's all plastics these days, son. Um, <laughs> that's, that is an obscure <laughs> reference, but uh, there you go. Um, but the. The uh, what uh, it's all an algorithm. It's all an it, it might the New York Times is an algorithm. It just happens to be an ed, a, a human editor, right? That is that is creating the curated feed for you to see in the New York Times. So if you trust the New York Times, you trust an algorithm. You trust it's a human generated algorithm in this case that is curating the news that it wants you to see. Yeah. And so that it, it, trusting the algorithm, all you're all you're doing is you're trusting. Uh, in what provides you value over time, you're removing risk, right? You're, you're, the perception is you're removing risk from your from your calculus of whatever it is you're doing. So you so you already do trust something that is an algorithm. The only question is which algorithms do you trust? And maybe you don't yeah. trust ChatGPT. That's fine, but you you already are trusting algorithms. So just know that and and that you know it. It will evolve sure, over. But I, I really do believe that there's a, some kind of in the future, who knows when, there's going to be like a Terminator scenario thing that will happen. And they'll say, oh, okay, well, I just watched that movie. And somebody said, oh, no, no, I, I only watch human created movies. I don't watch the. I don't watch the AI. I don't watch the chat GPT, whatever it's going to be called. There totally will be yeah, that crap. Yeah, it'd be like, yeah. oh, There's yeah, because totally you're going to have, I, you, you know, you can see it right now. Somebody can write a mystery novel using that technology, and it's probably going to be pretty darn good. Somebody yeah. will. Absolutely. That's that's the thing. Somebody will write novels and create movies that will be entirely AI built. And you you'll you'll know or you'll not know. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And that's you know, the funny thing is is that I had this same conversation with uh, in my social feed where I said, "Look, I, I I the answer is I don't care." You know, when I look at a piece of art, for example, you know, I look at a Kandinsky or I look at a Jackson Pollock or I look at uh, you know a, a Van Gogh. I don't care how they made it. And and if you told me that Van Gogh used some special cheat code to uh, create Starry Night, I don't care. I'm I'm still it moved is. by it. It still is. It's, yeah. it, it still is, and it's and it's in the context of the rest of that artist's work. So I'm still moved by it, no matter what tools they use to create it. And so when you tell me that Jackson Pollock used swinging paint cans from ropes to make some of his art, I don't care. I don't care. I don't consider that a cheat. I just, I, if I'm moved by it, I'm moved by it. If the content moves me, then I'm moved by it. It doesn't matter how they, the artist made it. So you got moved by a robot? I, maybe. Maybe so. Yeah. I mean, it, a, and that'll be great. I won't tell anybody. That, it's okay. Yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> All right. Next. <laughs> The robot touched me, Joe. <laughs> touched the robot me touched in a me. special way. Remember, this that's, is a that's PG. That's the title of this episode. This is a PG That's podcast. the title of this Don't episode. Don't go any further that, than that. Yeah, that's the episode of title, is the, the robot touched me in a special place. Okay. And I'll get We're Dolly, too, to create there. an image for that. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's great. All right, let's move on. It's earnings season, folks, uh, for the last quarter. And a couple of uh, companies have, have announced earnings that were better than expected. Uh, the first one is Spotify, and we'll link to an article in The Verge, which is more than just their earnings uh, announcement. It actually goes into a bit of analysis on did they screw up or did they not? Uh, Daniel Eck says no. 
and yes. Uh, the, basically, the article opens up by saying, I could have run with a lot of headlines here, but this quote from Spotify's earnings call felt like the moment that best encapsulated the company's current situation. Spotify reported its Q4 2022 earnings this morning, and the results were strong in some key areas. Spotify became the first music streaming service to pass 200 million paid subscribers, uh, not, and uh, not that the others are actually regularly sharing those numbers, and it's closing in on 500 million monthly users, a target it's likely to reach this coming quarter. Revenues from subscriptions and ads were both up double digits year over year as well. But at the same time, those numbers weren't enough to stave off last week's layoffs, which saw Spotify cut 6% of its staff. There was a big reorg, and the company's operating loss jumped to 231 million euros, uh, about uh, $250 million. And the article goes on to talk a little bit about that, uh, what was going on with those layoffs. And basically said uh, that uh, Daniel Eck knew that these layoffs were going to be coming. Um, and his argument was that uh, while user growth is way up, the long-term investments uh, are starting to have impact. But some of that can affect some of the short-term earnings and uh, ability to do that. And talked a little bit about their doubt around uh, the premium uh, acquisitions that they've made in terms of content and some some of their missteps there, as he said. Uh, and then uh, we'll also talk about uh, Facebook or Meta, I guess, is probably the better way to look at that. And uh, their earnings, uh, this coming courtesy of Ad Age, actually. And the uh, article there says, Facebook sees strong advertising demand and hits 2 billion users in a boost to Meta's earnings. Uh, Meta reported better than expected sales during the holiday quarter, fueled by strong demand for advertising as it attracted more users to its Facebook social network. Revenue for the fourth quarter was $32.2 billion compared with Wall Street estimates of 31.6. Shares jumped more than 16% in extended trading. Meta is recovering from the worst year of its stock and company history. The company faced a decline in advertiser demand due to weakness in the broader economy and inflation, uh, ongoing war in Europe, and also the iPhone price privacy rules. They cut 11,000 jobs, or 13% of its workforce in November, the first ever major layoff. And then it basically all talks about how it comes in uh, context with their investment in the metaverse, which has also been challenging for the company. So what say you about these uh, these two earnings? Is Facebook back, baby? Well, it's interesting. If Facebook says they're going to focus on efficiency and profitability, and they buy back $40 billion dollars worth of stock and i think they've already done 20 some billion dollars worth of buybacks that's every investor wants to hear that news yeah uh so absolutely. it's good for the earnings per share it's it's good for looking at the overall costs in the organization so they're like okay finally i mean the 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 people that were out there talking about Zuckerberg all the time, they were like, oh, he's on his, he's spending money all over the place, whatever. They just said that they're not going to go crazy with that stuff anymore. And that's why, as we're recording this, the stock's up 24%, uh, which, by the way, if you got in a couple months ago when, when Meta was down to whatever they went down to, 80 bucks a share or something, you're really happy right now. You've just, you've just more than yeah. doubled your investment in about 60 days. So it's been kind of nuts with what's going on there. Um, it's just interesting. I was talking to some, we talk, you, you talk about a lot, you know, the, the layoffs and what they mean and what they don't mean, but sure. we are just correct. All these companies that are laying off people. I mean, HubSpot just laid off 500 people. Um, that was yeah. in the news this week. So you have all these companies that are just correcting. They just, they just overhired and using, <laughs> they just yeah. overhired and in using, 20, by the 20 way. and 21. They just, yeah, well, or or 2019 or 2018 or 2017 or 2016 or 2015 or 2013, right? I mean, it's 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 been going on for what we talked about last week was that this has been going on for almost which happens years. in a bull market. It does, yes. which happens in a bull market, and they overhired and over you know ex irrational exuberance they used to call it, and uh, overhired, and they're they're now correcting against that, and the reason it's all coming out now is because it's after the holidays. And with everybody announcing layoffs, it's a great time to do that because you get buried in the news. The, the, so you don't, you don't suffer the same consequences because everybody's doing it. So you do this. And, and, and as I said last week, companies, there are, there are so many companies that do this every single year. P&G most famously uh, lops off uh, a good chunk of, sure. of their employees every single year. And it just doesn't get covered because it happens every single year. 
And, um, and it'll be very interesting, by the way, because I was reading an article today about the general economy looking, you know, the job market still remains strong. Uh, the Fed literally this week decided to only raise uh, interest rates a little bit. And, um, and Wall Street is cheering that. So you've got inflation slowing. It's still a pain in the ass, but it's, but it's, it's slowing. You've got the jo- a strong job market. It very much looks like we could come out of this, you know, un, uh, relatively unscathed. It's a, possi- from an it's a possibility. I, obviously, the stock market thinks so because for the last month it's been on a tear. Because they think yeah. we've got we, inflation is they think, and we don't know because if you look at Europe, CPI is up in some of those countries. Inflation seems to be much higher in Europe than it is in the United States. So we don't know if that's That's going to be infectious and come back over here. But if you think you've got inflation under control and then what could happen is you could see the Fed do a 180 and start cutting rates. And you're going to be like, you're going to go right back to where we were a couple of years ago. Everybody thinking it's it's good times are here. But the the interesting thing, just to talk about the whole Spotify thing a little bit, they they're still you could say that they're they're taking the foot off the pedal a little bit when it comes to podcasting but to back to our other point so many companies started podcasts in the last year and they're now killing them i mean there's so many yeah. of these little projects that have started i mean you and i talk about it forever why does a content marketing program fail the number one reason is because it stops somebody killed it before it got going so you had all these exactly. content initiatives a lot of them using spotify and podcasts and all the they're they were all very excited about it in 2020 and 2021, and now those projects are gone. And that's affecting companies like Apple and Spotify, and they don't really know how yet. So they're, they're still yeah. long, the long play is still there. Podcasts, big, audiobooks are going to be huge on, on Spotify. Uh, but I think they're taking it very slow and saying, oh, we're just, we know it's going to come. We're just going to get our little growth here. We're going to be fine. We're going to monetize it. We'll make our money off the music in the meantime. And we know slowly that. 10, 20% of our business is going to be significantly in the hands of audiobooks and podcasts. Yeah. Here's a, it's a fascinating thing. I, I've, I've had this conversation twice now since, uh, since the end of last year um, with clients where they've said, hey, we want to build a business case for a podcast or a new video series or uh, a, new, uh, a new blog, you know, or a digital publication of some kind. And they're like, how, you know, how should we look at the budget? And my answer to that is budget out for at least a a year. You know, you have to build in the cost of what it's going to cost you for at least one year. Uh, So so in other words, if you're going to do a weekly podcast, you have to budget 52 episodes. If you're going to do a monthly podcast, it has to be at least 12 episodes. If you're going to do a digital publication, what's the publishing cadence and the strategy going to be? You need to budget out for that. However many writers, however many pieces of content, whatever that looks like. And they're like, wow, I, we were only thinking that we would budget the podcast for like the first three episodes and see how oh, we do. Geez. And I'm like, yeah, let me just let me just predict you will yeah. fail. Right. You you will absolutely anything inside six months because you're going to fail. Yes. Anything. And so you have to budget out for all of those things. And if that means you have to develop like topics and, and you know, what the episode titles are going to be in order to satiate the, the leadership that needs to approve such things, so be it. But you've got to architect it out that long and budget out that long so that you can actually give it a chance for success. It's the same with a TV series. It's the same with any it's marketing. the same with a movie. Yeah, it's the same with any content marketing, with any content marketing, right? When you're marketing a media product, it is going to be how are you marketing the thing as it exists over time, not as a campaign. In other words, when you market a movie, you're not market your marketing budget isn't just for the launch your your marketing budget includes opening day and then it also includes marketing that movie over the course of the next 6 months to the different you know platforms that it's going to be on how you're going to do a tour how you're going to do all those things because that's the that's ultimately what you're you're building you're building a process that's going to build that that's going to live much beyond its launch no, so date. it's that's so, that's so the, critical yeah. i mean think about when we launched killing marketing the book in 2017 and we did all the blitz up front and all that stuff and it's probably 1% of our total sales happened in the first totally month yeah. it all happens yeah. long tail 
It's the same thing with yeah. your content creation stuff. It just you have to. I mean, well, you know, a little inside baseball here, but we're going to have some a couple new sponsors coming up. Very excited about it. You and I have been talking about it, and so if yeah. you've noticed, we're you know we haven't had a couple sponsors because we. I go out there when I talk to somebody, I and they want to buy an episode. I say no. I say I can't promise you that it'll work. I can't just right. do it's one. And I said, yep. you have to make a commitment to this audience. And I said, you have to do it a number of times. It's just like when we used to sell print advertising. I said, if you're not in seven times out of the year, I can't I, I, I can't say it's gonna work. You gotta you gotta yeah, be in front of this exactly audience right. with a consistent message that's valuable on a regular basis. And if you don't want to do that, I don't know what to tell you. Go interrupt a lot of yeah. people in weird ways. <laughs> Go interrupt a lot of people in weird ways. Really? Right? That's that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's your that's the that opposite. That's the opposite of content marketing. That is it should be the it should be the tagline for our sales messaging. <laughs> if you don't want us, go interrupt people in a weird yeah, way because we interrupt people. We in a do, weird but way. but to see, but we do it consistently, <laughs> so it's okay. Well, actually, I should I should rephrase that. We don't interrupt people in a weird way. We just deliver a subscription product. We're in just a weird. weird. Way. Just we're, we're just, just weird. Strange. Yeah. All right. Very quickly here, we'll cover one quick story here because it is a, a really fun one, and it's one that Joe's been hot on the last. Uh, the last couple of months here. Uh, this is coming to us courtesy of Insider Intelligence from eMarketer. Uh, the headline here is LinkedIn finds early newsletter success, but there's more to come. Uh, this actually coming out just this week. The news LinkedIn's newsletter strategy is paying off, apparently. In an interview with The Information, Director of Product Management Karen Baruch, Bar- Baruch, 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 Karen, man, that's a weird spelling of Karen Baruch, anyway, said LinkedIn now boasts 63,000 newsletters, 10 times more than one year ago. Now, if you'd asked me that question, if you said how many newsletters are on LinkedIn, I would have guessed way more than 63,000. Right? But, Isn't that uh, an incredibly 60, low number? It just feels It feels, low. It's, I, I, it feels I, it's, extremely it's, low. But it yeah, is. Yeah, it feels like every because, day because I get we're in like a different, newsletter. We're in a different masks. group, right? We, we're all content creators talking to each other, so we see more newsletters. I suppose, yeah. yeah. That's true. That's true. 63,000 newsletters, uh, 10 times more than one year ago, That which is amazing to me. That means that there was, a year ago, 6,300 newsletters. That's, I mean, which, God, that's just crazy low. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the newsletter boom. LinkedIn's newsletter growth stands in contrast to the troubles facing companies like Substack, which were catapulted to success during the pandemic, but have had a hard time maintaining growth or profitability since. Last May, Substack canceled its Series C round after invest- investor interest slowed. It's not just Substack, though. Meta and Twitter both canned their newsletter projects recently to cut costs, but LinkedIn's content has been able to succeed due to its integration with the platform's regular feed and engaged users. What's next? LinkedIn newsletters are a creator economy success, but parent company Microsoft has grander designs for them as a generator of advertising revenue. LinkedIn newsletters were rolled out alongside several marketing and analytics features, but lack crucial advertising infrastructure themselves. At present, LinkedIn creators looking to monetize their newsletters must reach out to advertisers directly, but it likely won't be long before Microsoft adds functionality that connects users with advertisers a la TikTok's creator marketplace. Although such a service creators and advertisers with overlapping interests can forge partnerships, perhaps with Microsoft taking a cut of revenues, Microsoft push into AI could also come into play, helping automate ads for creators in newsletters. This is fascinating to me. I this whole article like just put LinkedIn newsletters in an entirely new category for me. I, it makes me want to start one, to be it, honest. Well, I mean, I can't tell you how surprised I am with the success. I mean, for those people that don't know, I mean, I launched my LinkedIn newsletter. I've only had three episodes, three issues out. Launched it a couple months ago. I think I've got almost 26,000 subscribers in two months. Now, granted, we talked about this before. I did start out with a good follower count, so great. But it's the activity that you have on LinkedIn. So I post, I'm posting at least once a day, active on other accounts. I'm adding a couple hundred subscribers every day to this, and I'm really getting good feedback. Now, the, what a lot of people don't know is LinkedIn has an educational component here. So they're starting to reach out to creators, helping them with their newsletters. There are, they've already had this program going on with traditional publishers and newsletter operators. So that's happening. So they, they know this is important. They're trying to help newsletter creators be better and more efficient at this thing. 
they're absolutely going to be able to monetize this and say, hey, we'll take a cut. We'll throw in a, you know, a related uh, sponsorship there for you. So they'll be able to generate revenue and throw that back to creators. And they are going to add some pretty serious, from what I hear, and I don't know, it's all hearsay right now, but they're going to add some serious analytics. So you'll know who's opening it what the percentage is, what they're clicking on, the same thing that you would get on any other newsletter service. So this is, so just think about this. Barely anybody's created newsletters yet. It's growing at 10 times. You could see this number be 500,000 newsletters next year. I mean, this could yeah. be really, really huge. And that that's, that's going to hurt a lot of traditional uh, newsletter players. If they ever got to the point where they could say that you could download your the contact information from the newsletters oh, it's a killer to they'll never it, it do would that. kill yeah, everything else out there that. yeah they would they will never do i'm just that. saying if they just did definitely. yeah they would kill themselves i don't know do i don't know about that i don't think so i think people would still stay on that but they would know they would feel good and say hey if anything ever happened i could move it you'd stay with linkedin you wouldn't move that yeah mm, i don't know about I don't, that i don't know just saying I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anyways sure doesn't that. really yeah. matter at this point yeah. Uh, uh yeah. we're bu- I'm bullish. I'm bullish on LinkedIn, and we'll talk about it in the special episode oh, yeah. next week. I'm bullish on newsletters. I'm bullish on them actually taking it seriously that they hadn't done in the past. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. All right, it is now time for your empirically proven favorite part of the show, which is our rants and raves section. Uh, and uh, before we get to Rants and Raves, we do want to encourage you to visit our site where we have all of the wonderful uh, show notes and the links that we have, and you can leave us messages. Thank you, by the way, for your kind messages, your show ideas. Um, we're getting all sorts of wonderful things there. We're getting a couple of voicemails. Um, it's really quite lovely. So do go check it out, thisoldmarketing.site, where you can uh, visit with us or uh, see the show notes and links and get all the stuff. Uh, you can obviously uh, sign up for newsletters there, just speaking of newsletters. Uh, uh, both uh, The Tilt as well as uh, our Experience Advisors newsletter. Uh, and if you're into content marketing, content strategy, creator economy, that's where you want to be. Um, so anyway, uh, enough of that. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, let me go, let me go. Like Mine's real quick. Go Mine's first? just a quick okay. shout out. Yeah. I want to hear yours because yeah. your your sounds very interesting. Uh, could be a rant. It's could be a rant. I don't know. Eh. Anyways, no, it's just it, a commentary. It's a, a rant. Just a comment. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. All right, that's All fine. Right. Go ahead. Um, All right. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Mr. Jimmy Donaldson. <laughs> Otherwise known as as Mr. Beat, it's funny. I was talking. I I did a speech at my old high school um, this yeah. week, and I asked them. I said, "Anybody ever heard of Jimmy Donaldson?" Nobody knew. I said, "You know Mr. Beast?" And everybody said, "Yeah, we know Mr. Beast." I'm like, "Okay, that's Jimmy Donaldson. He has a name. Mr. Beast is the." But wait a minute, hold on. Was it? Yeah, we know Mr. Beast, or was it like, "Yay, we know Mr. Beast"? Oh, they Beast. all just smiled. Whatever. They okay. well, right. they, what they really were raving about was be real was the social media app. They're all on, like, oh, if you, and I, that's why I, I said, I was talking about it, like, what's the, what's the app you're all using that I need to know about that, um, you know, over anything else? Be real. Be real. Oh, wow. Remember we were making fun of it okay. last year? Yeah, yeah. Well, now yeah, they, yeah. now they got 10 million people a day using that thing where you take a picture wherever, it, whatever it. it prompts yeah. you. We'll see where it goes, yeah, but kids are onto it. We'll, we'll talk about yeah. that on our special episode next week. Anyways, just a little shout out again, uh, Mr. Beast changing the world one video at a time. Uh, there's a video I'll put it in the show notes. He paid for a thousand people who could not see to get cataract surgery. <laughs> he paid for it, paid for all the surgery for everyone. They couldn't afford it. I'm like, come on. Like, this is like yeah. Santa Claus on steroids. This is amazing what this guy can do. I really believe if he ever decided that he wanted to run for president, he, he would get it. He would get it in a landslide. I'm, he's got 131 million subscribers. This video that I'm that I'm looking at, 75 million views in four days. 75 million views in four days, 275,000 comments. Um I, I don't know if this this kid's unstoppable because he's got all the money in the world and he's very altruistic and he wants to change the world for the better. I I, I just have to I, I just don't I'm in awe. Yeah, I'm in awe because I immediately no, want to think it can't be yeah. real. Like it can't he can't just be a really nice guy that wants to do these right. things. And it's like he he's you know of course he's making money. He's I mean the oh, of course, the feastable yeah. snack the Mr. B snacks they're flying off the shelves at Walmart. 
You can't even get them. He he he's sell he's selling something like I don't know hundred thousand like two hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollars a day just in feast, feastables. I don't know what it's wow. it's crazy. It's amazing. It's crazy. Anyway, shout out to Mr. Beast. Crazy beast. Yeah. Crazy so crazy beast. What do you got? Um, all right, uh, I got uh, a very quick one uh, as well. So Oscar nominations are out. Um, we'll see who gets slapped this year. Did you see everything? <laughs> Everything, everywhere, all the time, uh, or whatever. You know, the funny thing is, that's the one movie I have. Oh my not god! Seen. And and I now I have to see it because it's gotten it's getting nominated I, for everything. My son, I mean, my son asked, wanted to see it. We were on vacation. Say, hey, can we can we watch this? Uh, so we did the little free subscription to Showtime, so I could go yeah. watch it. Oh my god! I, I haven't seen a movie that different in years. I wanted. To, I definitely want yeah. to see it. I definitely. I'm definitely going to see it before, certainly before the sure. award show. Um, and um, uh, have, I've been watching. Have you been watching Last of Us? Well, you're not a series. No, guy. I have like to. Series. I have to admit so, something. So my what? my w- wife was out of town, and she says whatever things that I would watch normally. You know, when it's like ten o'clock yeah. at night, I have to do that. I have yeah. to watch something that she wouldn't normally watch. And I've been sure, just hearing these raves about Last of Us, and I watched the first two episodes. It is pretty. It's fairly uh, impressive. Oh my! Have you, you have you seen episode three yet? No, I've got to boot it up here. Oh, Isn't that when Nick oh Offerman comes in or something like that? Oh, it's yes, it's it's. I incredible. heard. Well, I saw the Jeff. Be- Maybe one of the best episodes of TV I've oh, okay. seen. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to watch. Yeah. I, I saw the Jeff Bezos tweet or whatever said that that uh, Nick Offerman's performance was just unbelievable in Last of Us, and I'm like, he's. I didn't even know he was in that. So. Oh, it's. It's, okay. It's it's an incredible episode. No spoilers all right. at all. It's. I, I will incredible. check it out. We'll talk about it next week. All right. Yeah. Very, very quick. Uh, this is there's a fascinating chart uh, in uh, this comes courtesy of Axios, which will, of course, we'll link in the show notes that talks about how for the first time in three years, Netflix did not receive the most Oscar nominations of any movie studio. Um, and it shows additionally how Amazon is down. Apple is down. Uh, but all the traditional studios are up. Uh, and uh, basically, tech firms have invested billions of dollars on these movies over the last few years. And we've talked about it on this show about how the tech streamers, the Netflixes, Apples, Amazons, et cetera, are winning Academy Awards now routinely. And by the way, spanking uh, the traditional movie studios when it comes to uh, Oscar noms over the last five, six years. And interestingly, uh, the uh, b- the fascinating thing that this uh, this this chart shows is how the traditional studios, basically Paramount with Top Gun Maverick, uh, Warner Brothers with Elvis, Disney's the Avatar, uh, all of this stuff that is that is going on with has just really it's changed a little bit. It's changed the way that. The Amazon, or the, excuse me, the 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 Oscars uh, are being awarded, and I, my theory on this, they don't actually posit this theory when they show this data, but the, I think it's very interesting. The fascinating thing to me is that where the streaming networks used to be, where you would go for the artistic, on the edge, uh, edgier types of things right which it's where you know it started really with hbo with hbo basically taking a lot of risks on uh, edgier content Mm -hmm. that would be award-winning but quite honestly would have a niche following the streamers sort of followed that uh that idea that formula and had a lot of the edgier types of shows that would never and movies that would never make it to the big screen because they're just not popular enough they're not you know they're not tentpole movies but what what has happened is is that there's been a little bit of a swing back where the movie studios are now doing a little bit edgier stuff. Even Disney, right to the to the to the extent that they're doing some stuff that they might not have done before when it comes to more adult oriented entertainment. Um, and you've got again some of the studios investing again now that we're sort of post pandemic into some of these bigger, more popular movies. Uh, you know, Maverick being sort of the, the the example of that, Avatar being another example of that, and starting to swing the swing it back the other way. In other words, the streaming services are going more mainstream because they have to because they're all fighting each other for subscribers, and the studios because they're trying to be innovative and get people back into the theater are going a little more artistic. 
So I just think it's fascinating thing to watch as you sort of step back and look at the data and go, huh, it's fascinating how we may have counted out the big studios way too soon from a from a from a being able to produce quality standpoint it just it, it's just interesting that these streaming services are now really becoming a little a vanilla you know what i mean and some of this is going to have to force some of these streaming services to begin to forge an id for themselves this is where i think disney really has the opportunity to uh differentiate out there because it's got the opportunity to really carve out an identity for itself that Netflix is, you know, kind of just another network now. It doesn't really have an identity about it. HBO Max definitely does with its big studio backing. So there's a real interesting dynamic going on here in terms of the uh, the elements of content and the quality that they're producing. Seems like they're all I, I totally get the difference in the brands and what what you perceive for each one of the streaming services, but it's starting to feel like it, when you say streaming service, I, like there's no real differentiation. If you look at Apple, if you look at Paramount, if you look at Netflix, they all have their streaming stuff, and then they all they're all doing movies for the for the silver screen. I mean, they're all they're doing all of it. All of them, they're yeah. all doing the same stuff. Remember, it was like five years ago we predicted, oh, we're, we're predicting right now that Amazon or Apple is going to win a Oscar. Well, yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, now, yeah, now it's like no-brainer. Yeah, of course they are. But at the time, yeah, it was a big deal. It's all the same now. It's just crazy. Just yeah. Like, we're all media yeah, companies, just a, folks. I don't know if you've heard. We're all yeah. media companies. Anyway, I think it does, spe- it does speak a little bit to the, the content marketing in us as well. It's carving out that identity is important. Yep. So carving out that identity and differentiation and not becoming vanilla with your content is the is the message there. Um, all right, what do you got? What do you got this week? Well, um, so one of the reasons why we're doing a special episode is because I I am traveling. Uh, and and yeah. those of you who listen on a regular basis will notice in the next five months that I will be traveling more, <laughs> uh, both for business and a lot of, of pleasure, uh, especially for the fact that it is February now. And uh, I don't know if people know this, but February, I get a little bit of the blues because I usually don't see the sun in Cleveland, and I try to go yeah. to the sun. So I will be going to find the sun over the next week. Uh, and uh, and so hopefully, uh, you know, warm up a little bit, get out of this 15-degree uh, weather, which is what we're in right now, and see the sights. What are you doing? What's going on? Uh, well, I, I would encourage you to come to Southern California, where it is sunny, <laughs> sunny, sunny, and more sunny. Um, having, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, I won't go into it now, but I just I came out of the tech apocalypse, where I had a complete meltdown of all my internet equipment in my house, so... Uh, I have been in IT hell the last week, so I'm going to do a lot of nothing technical over the next week. I'm going to try and get out in the sunshine, take some hikes, and do some things, and of course, client work. Client work, client work, client work. All good stuff. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Um, All right. Well, that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. We will see you next week, and remember, before we see you next week, it is your story to tell. Tell it well. See you next week. This old marketing.